And it's such a beautiful thing because we don't even have to understand it, do we? But what we can do is we can open our minds and we can open our hearts and we can appreciate, we can celebrate, and we can experience the differences that make us all truly one. I think it's really important to go beyond the mind, to go beyond conjecture of oneness. I think it's incredible to live our oneness in one way or another. And so sometimes what that means is that we experience other cultures. And as we experience them with an open mind and an open heart, we see and feel people different from us and yet the same as us. So to illustrate this point, I've asked Thomas Helen Slaben to come forward and talk to us about German, Germans and Germany. So welcome Thomas to the platform, please. physically more tight communities, it seems to me more is done uh, together. And to be honest, this thought just occurred to me, but it's, it's the result of my, of my study of history. It's probably the result, I think, um, of how Europe was built in the Middle Ages uh, with the manorial system where peasants were given a piece of land by a lord and lived in villages and worked that land together as a group, even though each individual farmer had uh, several lots of land that uh, produced a food for him and his family. All the fields were plowed as a group, and they were worked as a group, and they were harvested as a group, and you didn't just work on your own land, you worked on everybody's land as a group. And I think that that comes through, and that was the same all over Europe, and I think that comes through still to this day, in many ways, uh, I'd say that Europe is more communal. Whereas in the, in the States, of course, the, the, the driving force was to come here and make something of yourself by yourself, and the great distances between people made that necessary. Uh, in, in Europe, you were a lot more clustered, and therefore had the opportunity. Uh, so the next image is uh, 
well, there's a couple, but that's okay. The top left again um, <clears throat> is still Germany, and every little town has a marketplace where Myra mentioned little shops and stores that you go to to do your shopping instead of one huge one. The marketplace is where you go and get a lot of stuff, produce, meats, fish, cheese, bread, uh, stuff like that. And for instance, my mother still goes shopping every single day on foot, driving a little uh, car. Uh, and so those marketplaces, though, are a lot more than just a place to go shopping. You go to cafes, you can sit and have ice cream in the summer, or even in January, you can take winter coat, because you have to be outside. I think Germans or Europeans in general, all I know most about Germany is we, uh, maybe because of the lack of warm days, on average, uh, people go outside and, and uh, spend time outside more than just to get from point A to point B when it's much colder and, and really year-round. So it's a communal place, that marketplace, uh, really for all kinds of different things, not just special events, but really every day. You can see the same people. You know, my mom knows the, the people she buys her produce from by name, and they her. And uh, it's, it's uh, just a more familiar atmosphere. And the next image on the bottom right there, that's an example of kind of a, a, a similar communal thing. This is in Sweden, though. In Sweden, they celebrate Midsummer Night um, on June 21st, on, on the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. And the communities come together, <coughs> and they just whoever wants to, basically, which is most people, uh, they'll just bring flowers they picked often enough on their way to uh, the field in the, in the town where the, it's called Maypole here, but of course in June in Sweden, uh, will be first adorned and then raised and, and danced around. And so uh, this is my sisters and Annika and Eric and my niece Sophia, which you can barely see on the far left inside that wreath. <coughs> we were assigned or maybe just volunteered for the job of, of creating one of those wreaths. And if you go to the next image, we have the top left there, the maypole, uh, with the two wreaths hanging from the end. And then, of course, the whole thing is adorned and wrapped in greens and all kinds of flowers. And, and once that is done, the music starts and they start dancing around. And that's done every year. So I guess as a, as a final point, I think it, it's interesting because this, this uh, togetherness has produced a very different culture in, in, in a very different worldview because European, uh, depending on where on the political spectrum you stand here, are either hopeless socialists or or, uh, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what, what, what you can say, ignorant, but like, or, or dreamers, because there's a lot more that government does and is expected to do as a result of this feeling of mutual obligation, mutual togetherness. Uh, it's expected that the government provide for a lot of different things like health care, provide public transportation, even when it makes no financial sense things like that, uh, just because uh, the, the mindset in, in Europe in general, it seems to me, is, is more communal. Now, in, 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 in the U.S., you have, we have communities like this, where people certainly work and help each other, and, and my hope is that communities like this can spread that togetherness and uh, cooperation and mutual help and understanding bigger and bigger groups and, and uh, kind of recreate. That's one thing I miss, uh, I think, a little bit. As much as I love living in the U.S., where I've been now for 25 years, um, one thing that's, that's a little bit sad for me is, is that there's not as much uh, feeling of, I need to do what I can for you.
Thank you so much. Wow, that was wonderful, Thomas. Thank you. Well, I wanted to um, also share a little bit about myself with you. Um, um, I'm half Japanese from my mom, and I'm half um, Chippewa or Ojibwa Indian um, from my father, who was a full-blooded Native American from northern Minnesota. And so you can imagine, I grew up in northern Wisconsin, and um, there's a lot of Scandinavians there. Um, so I really kind of stuck out a lot. And I said, every time, every time, ever since I was little, if I would go somewhere different um, that was not with people that knew me, I would always hear, what are you? <laughs> You know, and for a little shy kid, that was a big question. And even for an adult who felt rather timid, that was a big question. And people would then, not only would they ask me that, but then they would answer the question. They would say, so are you, um, are you Filipino? Are you Samoan? Are you Hawaiian? And then I would say, well, I'm Japanese. And they'd say, oh. Oh, yeah, 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 like that. And, and I thought, I passed the test. But anyway, um, one time, I got to tell you a funny little story. I was at a nail salon just down the street a couple months ago, and um, the, um, the um, person um, that was working on my nails, and she was Asian, and she said, so, what are you? And, <laughs> Just like that, too, just like that. And I said, oh, I'm Japanese. She said, no, you're not. <laughs> and I said, uh, I am. My mother was from Japan. No, you're not Japanese. And she said, um, I have neighbor Japanese. You're not Japanese. And I thought, what the heck, right? And I said, no, I am. And she's like, no, you're not. And so there we went, you know? And I thought, oh my gosh, how absurd. So you can imagine when in, in the summer of 2015, I finally fulfilled a dream, and I went to Japan. I wanted to meet my mother's um, relatives, some of my aunt, my aunt, who I met once before, but some uncles and cousins and other people I'd never met. So I finally went um, just a couple years ago, and it was an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. It was just filled with... Uh, so much love and excitement. My brother and his partner went, and the three of us were there, and it was so beautiful because, of course, I'm American, but I went there, and I immediately, immediately felt myself at home. I could feel this ancient culture of not only from my biology, but my mother's, my mother's heritage. And I started walking the way my mom used to walk, real small steps. You know, I always stand like this. Oh, my mother never stood like that. My mother was gracious. <laughs> and she, you know, and she just had this wonderful demeanor. And my voice, I'm very loud, and, and she would always talk very quietly. And so I started becoming more Japanese. And it was a great, you can laugh, that's really funny, actually. And, and it was beautiful, because I could feel myself. In, in the morning, I would wake up, and I would hear my mother's voice. And I would hear the people around me saying words and phrases that I remembered. It's like my soul had the memory of my mother saying those, those phrases and those words. And I started saying them. And then, as I was doing that, I would be walking out. And it was like walking in a sea of Asians. And I've never had that experience except for two days in Chinatown in San Francisco. <laughs> so there I was. I was walking in a sea of Asians. And I thought, I'm just like you, you're just like me. Nobody is saying, what are you? No, you're not. You know? And, and it, I just blended in perfectly, and it was a whole different experience that I'd never had at depth before. But, you know, I also am still American no matter where I am. And so there I was on the subway, 
and, and everyone on the subway is quiet. They don't sit and talk to each other. They're really quiet and they're very respectful of each other. They have their cell phones out and their little um, iPads and things, but they aren't talking because if you're talking, everyone can hear you and A, it's nobody else's business, so you don't do that, and B, it's rude to listen. So nobody talks. It's like being in a meditation chapel and you're on the subway and you are like this next to people. Well, I was sitting and I noticed this man pulled out his iPad. And he was watching a TV show, an American TV show. So he's sitting with his iPad open, and I'm next to him, and my brother and John is next to him, and my cousins are there, and I'm just looking. And I see it's Grey's Anatomy, and it's an episode I have seen. So he's looking, and I'm just doing this. Okay. Oh, and I'm all excited because I know what's going to happen next. And so he can feel me, and so his pad is up, and he suddenly tilts it this way. <laughs> so I thought, oh, I get it. Don't look. So I look away, and I don't talk. I'm quiet. Well, now he's come to the good part. So I can't help but look. And because now he's opened it back up because I've looked away. Now, and I can't help but look. And he can tell that I'm looking. It's just a fact. And so I say, I like it. I like it. Snap. And he shuts the iPad. Can you imagine? So, you know, wherever you go, you bring who you are. That's the bottom of that story. But I do want to share with you, I do want to share with you just a couple of quick pictures of that wonderful trip. One of the greatest things was being in the presence of a true geisha. This woman is, um, she was 21 years old. She had been a geisha for four years, and it is a way of life. She did a tea ceremony, and um, she did a dance for us, and she talked with us at length about her life and that her family supported her in becoming a geisha. And um, she said, I really want to honor tradition. And when you're a geisha, it is a lifestyle. It is not something you do as a job for eight hours a week or eight hours a day. It is who you are. And it is an honor and a tradition to, to be selected to be in a mother house of geishas. So this is the lovely woman that we spent time with. This next picture is a picture of one of the many, many, many shrines that are seen everywhere. This was a beautiful temple that um, was actually, this is a Shinto temple. My mom was Shinto, which is sort of like Native American in Japan. It's an earth religion. And people come up and they pay homage. Um, and the temples and shrines are either Buddhist or they're Shinto. And you come in, they're very ornate, but it's all about loving nature and honoring oneness. It's about bowing to the divine and really living a life of devotion to God. So we were in many, many, many temples during our time. And then lastly, I want to show you this slide. This is my family who came from near and far so that we would gather. Now, most of us could not speak English or Japanese. There were only two people that were truly fluent. One is my cousin leaning forward in the white sweater. She is my cousin Amy, um, who is very fluent. And so she was the interpreter for everybody. But I will tell you something. Um, we all came together in such love and hugs and laughter and tears. Uh, love knows no bounds. You don't have to decide that you have the same political persuasion. You don't have to like the same food. You don't have to even have the same kind of personality. Love knows no bounds. And my mother's brother, who I'd never met before, let me see if I can find him. He is, oh, I see him. He is standing in the back, and he's, um, he's got 
oh, that's my uncle um, with the glasses on, and my, my, unc my other uncle is right next to him. But there is Esau. Oh, yes. Do you see the man making the peace sign? The, that is my cousin Esau. And he was the one that my mom um, was very close to, and he would not leave my side. He sat with me. He, just, he would just do this. And, and my cousin interpreted, and she said, I want to tell you about your father, my biological father, because he knew him. And I want to tell you things that you would not know about him because I was there. And he proceeded to tell me stories about the father that left uh, my family when I was three. And when my mom was married to him, they lived in Japan for two years. And so he said, I, I knew him and I remember him. And he started to tell me all kinds of things that offered healing that I could not have any other way from anyone who was not there. And he just stayed by my side, and he had kind of a, a, a little tough time walking. And we just kept looking at each other in the eye. And there was so much love. There was so much gratitude and appreciation for one another, even though we didn't speak the same language. And when I would laugh and hug him, he would laugh and he would hug me, and there was no need for anything more. We are really one, all of us. And in today's world and in our country, where we attack each other and we hurt each other because of our differences in religion and culture, it is so important that we stretch ourselves. It is so important that we reach across those lines in peace and in love with an open heart and an open mind. And one of the best ways that we can do this is to follow the words of great teachers of great, great faith traditions. Our teacher Jesus told us, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And the prophet Muhammad, he said, whoever wants to enter paradise, let him treat people the way he would want to be treated. And then the Buddha. The Buddha said, all beings tremble before violence. All love life. See yourself in others. We are all one. We are all one in every way. And so I invite you to take some time to read about, to learn, to experience cultures that are different from you. Open to that experience with an open mind and heart, and then take the next step. Share that experience with others. Let the love you feel be a virus that you spread all around. Practice oneness. Heal that which needs to be healed. Open to the power of love and peace. I'm going to close with a poem from Black Elk, a medicine man, a holy man from the Aglala Sioux tribe. Close your eyes as you hear these words. I was standing on the highest mountain of them all, and round about beneath me was the whole hoop of the world. And while I stood there, I saw more than I can tell. And I understood more than I saw. For I was seeing in a sacred manner the shapes of all things in the spirit. And the shape of all shapes that must live together like one. I saw that the sacred hoop of my people was one of many hoops that made one circle together 
and the circle was wide as daylight and as starlight. And in the very center of the hoop grew one mighty flowering tree to shelter all children. And I saw that it was holy. Let us open to the hoops of our own traditions, to our own race, to our own cultures, and let us add our hoop among the many hoops that make one sacred hoop of all people joined together. We are one. We are one. We are one. Thank you.